that's why it's really fun to serve him. You know, I feel sorry for people. You know, some people just think, wow, church is just dead. It's dull. It's boring. <laughs> they just don't know. Or maybe that they're a wrong one. I'm not sure which. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know we're probably not the greatest thing that ever happened in the world, but uh, you got people that love Jesus, want to follow after Jesus, want to serve him, and are listening for his voice. That counts a lot. Amen? Praise the Lord. This morning I want to introduce uh, another subject, uh, kind of area. We've talked uh, in the past weeks about the teacher, the pastor, the evangelist, and uh, this morning I want to talk about a little I want to introduce the subject of the prophet, the office of the prophet, the ministry of the prophet. And so we'll be, we'll be talking about uh, it from some different aspects over the weeks. Next week we have a guest speaker, but then we'll be continuing with kind of this theme for a few weeks just to see what God has to say to us about the office of the prophet. Kind of if you live long enough, you see that what comes around goes around. And uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of kind of things that have happened in the church world, and some things are kind of cyclical. Uh, for instance, I think it was in uh, kind of the late 80s, it seemed like everyone wanted to be called a prophet or a prophetess. I mean, you read Charisma magazine or you, some kind of Christian news media, you know, there were prophets and prophetesses popping up all over the place. And some of them were probably genuine and for sure prophets of God or prophetesses of God. And some were wannabes. And, um, you know, God's not bent out of shape because some people misuse the gifts or make mistakes with the gifts or <laughs> and, you know, those kind of things. You know, he'd probably rather have somebody step out and do something than for all the church to sit and do nothing. And so one of the issues is is that the gifts of the Spirit and many of the ministries of the Spirit have kind of been shelved in favor of entertainment, in favor of, um, you know, some kind of uh, personality cult or some kind of uh, thing like that. Um, because sometimes, you know, people want to be something, and so they use the gifts. I mean, I I understand that. I get that. You know, we need to be, we have a need to be recognized. We have a need to be loved and to have purpose and so forth and so on. But sometimes in our humanness, we can take that, you know, pretty far (laughs) and get into trouble. You could probably go find some conferences somewhere where somebody will prophesy over you. Um, Those things are a little, uh, I shouldn't, I don't know if I should say scary to me. Because our pastor, he was kind of a really straightforward guy, Dr. Lester Summerall, and one of the things he was kind of conscious of, you just don't let just anybody lay hands on you. You know, because you don't know where those hands have been, for one thing. And, um, you know, if you don't know somebody, you don't know their ministry, you don't know their heart, you don't know if they're following God, I don't mean that you should just walk around being distrustful of everyone and everything, you know, because God can use perfect strangers to bring the one most wonderful blessings into the lives of people. <laughs> sometimes it happens on a plane. Sometimes it happens out in the store somewhere or at the workplace. You know, God can use his people anywhere, and he does. And sometimes it's the people that are not known for anything that are the biggest blessings in your life. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, all of the giftings and all of the ministries can be misused or abused. Uh, people can even use them for their own um, promotion, for their own financial gain and other kinds of things. But God put these ministries in the church. The Bible says that Jesus gave gifts to the church, ministry gifts to the church. And because he did, we ought to respect those gifts and those ministries that he's placed in the church. So that's really what we're about in studying these different subjects. It isn't just kind of random. Um, But I'd like to introduce this uh, 
message this morning with a, a word from Dr. Lester Summerall's book, The Gifts and Ministries of the Holy Spirit. This is what he says in, in that book. He says, if the church was moving in the spiritual gifts of revelation, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits, there would be no need for fortune tellers, crystal ball gazers, Ouija boards, tea leaf readers, palm readers, and all the other paraphernalia that the devil uses to deceive people of our generation. We are engulfed in the greatest wave of black magic and witchcraft this country has ever known. One reason for that is that the church has not properly operated in the gifts of the Spirit. We have not used the weapons of our warfare to stop the devil's counterfeits. And it just struck me as I reread that this week that... It's probably never more true. This book was written in the 80s, uh, but yet it's so appropriate and so true. The church needs to rise up and enter into the purpose and the plan that God has for it. And that plan and purpose is really well outlined in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if you'd like to turn there, um, Paul has this to say. Uh, I'm starting with verse 1, and I'm reading out of uh, the Names of God Bible. It's just a new, a new version that I've discovered, and I kind of like some of the things in it. It says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that all our ancestors who left Egypt were under the cloud, and they all went through the sea. They were all united with Moses by baptism in the cloud and in the sea. All of them ate the same spiritual food. All of them drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, so their dead bodies were scattered over the desert. These things have become examples for us, so that we won't desire what is evil as they did. So don't worship false gods as some of them did. As the scripture says, the people sat down to feast which turned into an orgy. We shouldn't sin sexually as some of them did. 23,000 of them died in one day. We shouldn't put the Lord to test as some of them did. They were killed by snakes. Don't complain as some of them did. The angel of death destroyed them. These things happened to make them an example for others. These things were written down as a warning for us who were living in the closing of the closing days of history. So people who think they are standing firmly should be careful that they don't fall. Just repeating one phrase from verse 11, these things were written down as a warning for us who are living in the closing days of history. As we look around, one of the things that becomes really apparent is that we're coming closer and closer to the end of times. And if you read even in the newspapers or news news media, you can find out that even unbelievers are conscious of this to some degree, that, you know, there might be a a nuclear holocaust or there could be this or there could be that, and people are talking about the apocalypse. (laughs) People who have never really read the Bible or studied the Bible are talking about things like this. So when Paul says this to the Corinthians, it's really a warning to us. He said, these things are written down as a warning for those who are living in the closing days of history. So the question is, is how can you be prepared for such days and such times? Let's just suppose for a moment that um, our generation is the final generation. And Jesus comes back, you know, before, you know, we age out and get put in the grave. What would that look like? What would the world look like during that time? What would God's church be doing when Jesus comes back? Will they be found doing the things that he said to do? Will they have the kind of wisdom to be ready like the wise virgins for the time that they're living in? Or will it be like the foolish virgins who let their lamps go out and we're out doing something else, going trying to find some oil for the lamps so that we can 
you know, go to the party, but, you know, the party's over before we get there. You know, for a lot of people, the party will be over. And we'll be entering another phase of eternity when that happens. So, one of my thoughts along those lines is, is that if the Bible says that Jesus gave ministry gifts to the church, we ought to pay attention because that might just be his way of preparing us for the time that we live in. So whether or not we're the final generation, we should be ready. Amen. As if we were the final generation. That's why he's given these kinds of giftings to the church. And so that's why we can't take it lightly, even if some of these things are misused or abused or you know, somehow somebody out there says something or does something and it's a little off. Um, the amazing thing is is that many times some people can be a little bit off, but still, you know, the power of God is there and healing is there and deliverance is there and other kinds of things are there because nobody's a perfect person. If you look at the characters of the Bible, the men and women of faith, the people that are listed in Hebrews chapter 11, one of the things that you become aware of is that, wow, some of those guys did some really pretty bad stuff. And they're still listed in that book. They're still listed in that chapter that says they were great men and women of faith. And they did great things for God in spite of the fact that they were in their human nature, their sin nature, many times took them in a wrong direction. But God is merciful and his plan is really to use men and women and young people of every generation to do his mighty works. So that's why we're studying these things. You know, many of these recorded warnings that Paul is writing about, these, these warnings were given by inspiration of God to the prophets of old. So let's take a look in the book and um, just kind of think about some of these aspects of the office of the prophet. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, it says, So we regard the words of the prophets as confirmed beyond all doubt. You're doing well paying attention to their words. Continue to pay, <clears throat> excuse me, continue to pay attention as you would to a light that shines in a dark place as you wait for the day to come and the morning star to rise in your hearts. First, you must understand this. No prophecy in scripture is a matter of one's interpretation. No prophecy ever originated from humans. Instead, it was given by the Holy Spirit as humans spoke under God's direction. These were God's prophets and prophetesses that he was speaking about here. Not the counterfeit prognosticators sent by Satan to imitate the real and the relevant word of the Lord. These are men and women of God who spoke as they were moved some of the versions say, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so that's why Peter is saying, since these things were confirmed beyond all doubt, we would be doing well to pay attention to them. Um, another place Paul says, to, I think it's to the Thessalonians, don't despise prophesying. Don't despise prophecy. You know, sometimes when I see misuse or abuse of a gift, you know, what happens? You know, something rises up into it and we just want to write the whole thing off. It's just like, I just, you know, I just stay away from goofy, you know. <laughs> and um, I think, I think largely that's the way the charismatic or word of faith and Pentecostal movement has been considered by a lot of people, just goofy. Because there have been things that have been unexplainable and sometimes they have been just really goofy <laughs> because people do stuff and some of the stuff is not you know real but the I, I think maybe Kenneth Hagin said it best eat the hay and spit out the sticks <laughs> be as smart as, at least as a horse you know they, they, they figure that out so 
These prophetesses and prophecies, prophetess, these prophets and prophetesses that brought the word of the Lord, all those things are recorded. They're recorded for us. They're recorded so that we can be prepared for the age that we live in. There's something that we should pay attention to. They have confirmation after confirmation. And they, they are validated by the events happening just as they spoke. You know, one of the things about prophecy is, is in the Old Testament, one of the commands of God was, is if a, if a, if a prophet spoke a false prophet, they should take him outside of the city and heap a pile of rocks on top of him. That was the penalty for false prophecy. <laughs> now, if that were done in our day, there might be lots of rock piles around because there's a lot of stuff that's said by people that doesn't necessarily come true. And then there's the whole subject of, you know, some say some prophecies are subject to change because, you know, God intervenes. And there's probably some truth to that. If you remember the story of Jonah in the Old Testament, what he did was he walked through that city and he prophesied in three days that city would be destroyed. But in the meantime, the king and all the people, from oldest to smallest, began to repent in sackcloth and ashes, and God spared that city. So Jonah's prophecy didn't come to pass. And you know what? He was ticked. He was mad. <laughs> he was really mad because he was, he was sitting there waiting for the fire to fall. And uh, isn't that so like us? <laughs> You know, we'd rather see some terrible prophecy come to pass than to see God intervene and do something good in somebody's life, you know, because they deserved it, you know. Of course, Jonah thought he was justified in how he thought. But God dealt with him, and it was a big lesson to us. So I suppose there's something to be said, you know, for some prophecies not coming true because it could be intervented. It could be God's intervention and repentance of people, you know, that changes the course of and the direction of things. So, uh, but what about today? What about the church, the body of believers, the ecclesia, the called out ones? Um, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul, Paul writes this about the, the subject of the ministry gifts that Jesus gives to the church. He says in verse 4, Ephesians 4, 4, There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, just to kind of take a mental note of that, is that uh, the measuring stick is the gift that comes from Christ or the Messiah, who was Jesus Christ the Lord. Verse 8 says, Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led host, uh, a host of captives. He gave gifts to men. In saying ascended, what does it mean? But, but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended above the heavens that he might fill all things. Now look at this. He says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds or pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. So when Jesus went back to heaven, he sent back gifts. He sent back ministry gifts, valid ministry gifts to the body, to the called out ones, the ecclesia, the church. He sent gifts. So here's a question. Supposing you're a parent and maybe it's birthday time for your child and you buy this wonderful gift and you give that great gift to your kid and your kid takes one look at it and says, I didn't want that. It's not the right color. I don't like how it looks. And you're thinking, I spent money for that. <laughs> what do you mean you don't like that? <laughs> what do you mean it's the wrong color? 
But how do you think God feels when we take lightly the gifts that Jesus went to the cross, to the grave, descended and ascended to send back to us? Those gifts, those ministry gifts of apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. And yet a lot of people are really casual about it. When I traveled with Lester Sumrall for some years, one of the things that it always just really kind of got to me, how some people were disrespectful to him. I mean, I, I, I get it. I understand some people don't know people, you know, and whatever. But, uh, you know, some people just walk up and say, call him Lester. And I know some of that's cultural. If you live in Europe or something, they address you by the first name. They rarely address you by your last name. But in America, people in a church who didn't know him saying, Hi, Lester. They used to just kind of get to me. Wouldn't even call him pastor or acknowledge, you know, the office that he stood in. And yet he was a great man of God. It's about respecting the gifts that God has given to the church. In verse 13, Paul starts to lay out the reason for these gifts. He says, until we all attain to the unity of faith, to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ. So that's the first purpose of those giftings. And if you look at each of those aspects of it, um, let's just take the first one, for instance, the unity of faith. Where do you see that today? I mean, you can't get five pastors together to do one thing in a city. (laughs) Where is the unity of faith? Some churches are so divided and so in strife that it's impossible to have unity. And then look at the next one. The knowledge of the Son of God. Do we know him as well as we should know him? Do we know him as well as we could know him? Remember, the ministry gifts were given to bring unity And to bring us to a greater knowledge of Jesus. Not just a head knowledge. I know the facts about his life, his death, his resurrection. But uh, do you really know him? And then it says to a mature manhood. To maturity. Probably one of the curses of the church is the immaturity of believers. And then there's another aspect mentioned. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. (laughs) So the question is, do we measure up to him? If we don't measure up to him, we need more of those giftings and those gifts ministering into our lives so that we can measure up to the fullness of the stature of the measure, the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ. In other words, when the world looks at the church, they should see Jesus. Amen. When they look at you, when they look at me, they should, see, they should see Jesus. And if they're not seeing Jesus, there's something wrong because we're not measuring up to the fullness of his stature. <laughs> you know, the Bible says Christ in you is the hope of glory, but is, uh, the question is, are people seeing the hope of glory when they see you? He's the fullness of him that filled all in all. But are people seeing that when they see you, when they see me, when they're looking for some manifestation of God? Are they seeing it in the body of Christ? So that's the reason that Jesus sent back these gifts was to bring the called out ones to that place where these attributes were the mark of the church. 
So then verse 14 gives another reason. He says, so that we may no longer be children. Again, that's speaking of maturity, I suppose. Tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. I don't know if you've been to the beach lately, but if you go to the ocean and there's some really big ones coming in and you can see them hit the kids, they wash adults away, but the kids, they just, (laughs) they roll them. But Paul says, that's a picture of an immature body of Christ, tossed to and fro by the waves, carried by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. You know, it's amazing what some people believe about the Bible, about Jesus, about God, the picture they have of God. Because it's a picture that's not based on the reality of the Word of God. Oftentimes it's based on stuff they've, they've seen on TV or some things they've imagined or by some experience they've had in some place. And so you need to kind of see, how did I get this image of this God who loves me? who cares about me, who sent his son to die for me. Where did I get that image? Then verse 15 says, Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from from whom the whole body is held and joined together with every joint which is equipped when every part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So these ministry gifts are meant for that purpose, that purpose of putting that. So the ministry of the prophet is no different than the rest in that sense, is that it has a place in the body, the ministry of the prophet has a place in the body to bring a word from God that accomplishes those things in the lives of men and women who are following after Jesus. So we need desperately these ministry gifts in the body. Now, sometime later, we'll talk about the difference between the office and the prophecy, and some uh, the office of the prophet and someone who who prophesies. Just because you prophesy doesn't necessarily mean that you're a prophet. Because any believer who has the gifts of the Spirit operating in their lives could be used by God to bring a prophecy, to bring edification, exhortation, and comfort to people. But not everybody stands in the office of a prophet. In fact, there are probably far fewer prophets than other kinds of ministry gifts, even though many times people want to call themselves a prophet. Or you can go to a conference and, you know, they'll sit in a room and have somebody... Come and prophesy over you. Be careful. So for our own time, there are still prophets and prophetesses, men and women using the revelation gifts of prophecy, words of wisdom and words of knowledge. Now, sometimes, you know, have you, have you read about the Old Testament prophets? How sometimes they were a little strange? <laughs> like the prophet Jeremiah, you know, going naked, for a period of time, the prophet Hosea marrying a prostitute because God told him to marry a prostitute as a sign to the people of Israel. Um, don't don't get me wrong; not all of them were like that. Moses was a prophet, and he wasn't weird. <laughs> he just was, you know, he had unusual experiences and a close place with God, and he prophesied out of that. But some things were highly unusual. And sometimes that's what people see when they turn off to the gift. They see something unusual and they think, that couldn't be God, you know, God surely would not do that. And yet it may be God. He may be trying to get your attention with some of those things that seem to be an oddity. And he may have spoken a specific to that person that they're living out in a way to demonstrate something that he's trying to tell you. So be be careful before you criticize, but you can always measure things with the Word of God because that's where our safety is. If it's not in the Word, it's probably not God. Take it to the bank. 
God doesn't contradict himself. He always speaks forthright and in a way that people can receive. So the purpose of prophets today, men and women who use these revelation gifts of prophecy, the words of wisdom, words of knowledge, discerning of spirits, the purpose of those things is still one. That's to edify, in other words, to build up, and secondly, to equip God's people for the work of the ministry. So I thought it would be appropriate just to use an example. So I'm going to do a video, put up a video here by Kenneth Hagin. Kenneth Hagin is considered by some to be prophets. He might not be considered by everybody to be a prophet. But my pastor spoke highly of his accuracy in prophecy and so forth. So anyway, let's just take a look here. Many are concerned about the future and they wonder what will happen. Will darkness overtake or will the light shine bright? Yea, saith the Lord of hosts, remember that you're in my hands and remember that I know the future better than you know the past. And all is well. I will alert you concerning that which will affect you. I will show you the way to go and you'll walk in it and be blessed above all the people of the world, upon the earth. You shall be blessed for thou art my people and my people shall rule and reign and the blessings of God will fall upon them. The latter rain shall be poured out, yea, upon nations that are now barren and void. But the rain will be poured out. The seed will be planted. The harvest will come. The glory of God will shine upon the earth. Am I kin soon gun doom bung gun ding gang gin dom bung gon dung gun dung gin sing gang go bo da alobratuta and they of the world will walk on in the way in which they walk, and the darkness shall overtake them, but ye shall walk in the light. The entrance of his words giveth light. Walk according to the word. Walk in the word. Walk in the spirit. The power shall rest upon you and the glory of God shall be seen upon your face. Many shall turn to the Lord. Great days, great times, great blessings are ahead. So rejoice and be glad. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Samahara Kedi Fini Boda. Sina Marakono Namakaye Dei. Yusuhu Ugaguda Maang. En Sangum Bangile Frepefe Ejido Stostondo. Brivrefe Eje Papa. Meme Mehesu Tornenge. Kanga de Bingano. Ondo Kanste. Frepefe Esimohote. Il suo conto non è mongo un dalla, le frebe fe e supporto, e fe e pekin kun 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 to no mongo un sanga, anskangegehim. Many are concerned about things that have happened, the terror that has taken hold of the hearts of many. Many are concerned about war, many are concerned about the future. Darkness seems to be developing, dark clouds on the horizon of time, but yea, saith the Lord of hosts, Walk not by what you see with the physical eye. Walk not by what you feel with the physical feeling. Walk not according to what your physical senses tell you. But walk according to what my word says. Walk according to what the Holy Ghost is saying unto you. For he's speaking unto many hearts. They walk on in the natural and pay no attention to their heart. He's speaking to many spirits. They walk on in the realm of the mental thinking their own thoughts, planning their own way. But yea, saith the Lord of hosts, listen to what the Spirit is saying, to your heart, to your spirit. And what he said to you, act upon it, act upon it, act like it's so, rejoice and be glad. In the face of adversity, in the face of seemingly naturally defeat, laugh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. The 
because you have inside information. Information inside the Word. Information given by the Spirit. Glory to God. Glory to God. And it shall all come to pass. Amen. Amen. Praise God. That's what the Spirit of God said. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. All right, so that was maybe a little bit unusual, and he used both tongues and interpretation and uh, prophetic giftings, a word of wisdom, a word for the future. And um, it couldn't be more truer now than it was many years ago when he spoke that. He's been dead for quite a number of years already. But that is kind of the flavor of the prophetic. It's put in the body to bring an encouragement to you. Could you hear the words of encouragement? Did it come through? Could you feel the spirit of encouragement arising as he was speaking? So even though he's dead, God is still speaking through him. It's the amazing thing of technology, but it's also the amazing thing of the prophetic. Things still ring true. You can read the Old Testament prophecies and still be touched in your heart and motivated to live right for the end times because God is an awesome God. So, how do prophets do what they do? Let's take a look at that for just a moment and then we'll break into small groups and you can talk a little bit about what you've seen and what you've heard this morning. Um, Let's take a quick review of the revelation gifts because that really is the purpose of the prophet, to bring revelation from God to the people. Uh, The revelation gifts are three gifts, gifts of the Spirit. You can read about them in the book of 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. Those revelation gifts are the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the discerning of spirits. All of those are operations of the Holy Spirit that reveal something. If you read about it in 1 Corinthians, the first, uh, the 12th chapter, the first verse, it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. Verse 4 says, There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation, that would be the revelation, of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So, in other words, when these gifts are given and when they're manifested or revealed, they're supposed to bring profit to everybody. So, for instance, when Brother Hagin was was speaking in tongues, he immediately followed it with interpretation so that everybody could understand because the purpose of the gifting was not just to say something between him and God, but to bring a message to the people. Um. Verse 7 says, But the manifestation is given to each to profit of all, for to one is given a word of wisdom. That's the first revelation gift. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. And then if you skip down to verse 10, it says to another, discerning of spirits. So a person who operates in the office of the prophet has one or more of these gifts operating in their ministry, either word of wisdom, word of knowledge, or discerning of spirits. Those three gifts are revelatory, God revealing something to the human person for the purpose of ministering to another person or for ministering to a group of people. So let's look at just briefly at the word of wisdom. Word of wisdom is making God's wisdom known concerning future events without conferring with others, events that will occur in the future. All of the Old Testament prophets possess this gift of the Holy Spirit. So in other words, a word of wisdom has to do with something that's out there, hasn't been yet. And so then when a prophet gives forth a prophecy, we call them prophecies oftentimes, but he's really speaking in a word of wisdom. This is going to happen in a future time. Examples in the Bible are Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 53. Remember how he talked about... The, about Jesus. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. Chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes were healed. He was looking prophetically to what would happen at the cross, how Jesus died and what would happen as a result of that. In the New Testament, an example would be like Agabus in Acts chapter 21. 
It says uh, in verse 10, while we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him to the hands of Gentiles. And it happened exactly like that. Paul went to Jerusalem and he was bound and he was uh, then eventually ended up in Rome in prison. So that's how the word of wisdom works. It's speaking about something in the future. The second gifting that uh, uh, the prophet would have would be the word of knowledge. A word of knowledge is a fragment of God's vast knowledge of the present and the past. So in other words, God doesn't just download all of his knowledge into somebody and you give the whole thing, but he just gives you a fragment of it, gives you a piece of it. Many times it's for the purpose of ministering to people. You would just know something that would you'd have no other way of knowing except that God put that in your heart as you're ministering to somebody. Uh, this examples are persons or places or events of things that exist now or that existed in the past. This knowledge is not knowledge that's that's attained through study or conferring with others or personal experience. It's something that comes directly from God. And often it's related to dealing with emergencies or other issues uh, that defy solution. Examples in the Bible of the word of knowledge are, for example, in Second Kings 5, uh, Elisha and Gehazi. You remember Elisha ministered to Naaman, a leper. The leper came from Syria. He was a general. His, uh, his servant had said, there's a prophet in Israel who can bring healing to you. And so... Naaman came, Elisha didn't even come out of the house, and Naaman was mad because Elisha just said, go dip in the Jordan five times, and however many times it was, and, you know, he was just upset, but finally his people convinced him to do it, so he went into the Jordan, he dipped in the Jordan, he came back healed, and it was an amazing thing. So then he wanted to give a gift to the prophet, and uh, the prophet turned him down, he said, you know, you can't buy the things from God, you know. I'm not taking this. Just take your stuff and go. And uh, But Gehazi, Elisha's servant, went and followed him and said, Hey, my, my master changed his mind. <laughs> How about giving me some of the loot? And so he collected from Naaman, who was happy to give it to him, and then he went and hid it, and he came home to Elisha. But Elisha called him on it and said, Hey, my spirit went with you when you went and got that stuff. <laughs> so he had a word of knowledge about what happened to his servant. He didn't see it. He didn't know any. He didn't have any other way to know it. It just he could tell it. Another example from New Testament is Jesus with the woman at the well. Remember the woman at the well? He talked to her. He engaged her. Some of the some of the greatest gospel is in that John chapter four where he's engaging this woman and talking to her about spiritual things. And uh, then he asks her to bring her husband. And she says, I don't have any. <laughs> and he said, you've rightly spoken. You've had five. And the one you're living with now isn't your husband. <laughs> he didn't know the woman. Nobody had told him. But God showed him. So that woman ran back to the other people in the town and she said, come see a man who told me everything about my life. (laughs) And it brought the whole city to Jesus to minister. So that's the word of knowledge and how the word of knowledge works. The final gift is the discerning of spirits. Now this one is probably the most misunderstood gift, possibly the most misunderstood gift because... People call discernment and discerning of spirits a lot of things that it isn't. But it is a supernatural ability from God to see the presence and the activity of a spirit that motivates a human being, whether good or bad. It's insight into the spirit realm, into the spiritual arena where the five physical senses cannot enter. Um, What it is not. The discerning of spirits has no relationship to that which is natural. It is not some kind of metaphysical operation. It is not thought reading. It is not psychoanalysis. It's not projection or extrasensory perception. 
It has nothing to do with the realm of the mind. Some people claim to have the gift of discernment, but there is no such gift. It's not a discernment of things. It's a discernment of spirits. It's not primarily discerning devils. It's not a clash of human personalities. And it for sure is not the gift of suspicion. (laughs) So, those things all came from Dr. Lester Summerall's book, that description of that in Gifts and Ministers of the Spirit. You can read more about it there. But the issue is, is that you know, when we go out with Revive, we say, love, listen, discern, and respond. That's not talking about the gift of discernment. That's talking about, you know, you have some insight into the situation. After you love a person and listen to them, you have some insight to that person's life and how to minister to them. Now, God may download into you some kinds of giftings, a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom for that person. And he could give you the gift of discerning of spirits where you could actually see into the person's life or into the person's human spirit and determine, see what's in their heart. But that's not in general just discernment. So examples from the Bible are Isaiah. Remember the Bible says when King Isaiah wrote, when King Uzziah died, I saw the the Lord. He was high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. He was looking into the spirit realm and he was seeing the Lord sitting on the throne. He was seeing the throne room of God. He was in a different place uh, than the place he was actually physically located. Um Another example in in Acts chapter 8, you remember the story of Simon the sorcerer. Simon the sorcerer was uh, converted with the people in Samaria when Philip preached to them. And the Bible says that they sent John and, and, and Peter to Samaria to lay hands on them so they'd get filled with the Holy Spirit. And... Uh, Everything was cool, everything was good, but Simon the sorcerer, he saw that when they laid hands on people that they could impart the the Holy Spirit into them or that people received the baptism in the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands. And so he offered them money. He said, here, let me give you some money so that I can have this gift so when I lay hands on people, they get filled with the Spirit. And Peter said, your money perish with you. Your heart is not right. He looked into the spirit realm, the spirit of that man and said, look, that's not right, and your money's going to perish with you. History tells us that that man turned against God, actually, and became a persecutor of the church. So these are amazing gifts, and those three gifts, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, and discerning the spirits are the primary gifts of the prophet. Because when he's in the office of a prophet, he has been given those giftings by God in order to minister in a particular way. And so he can sometimes tell things that are in the future. That's why Dr. Summerall said, you know, if the church was operating in these things like it should be, you'd never need a fortune teller. You'd never need a soothsayer of any kind or a palm reader of any of those things. Amen? So I want to close out this segment with this quote from Dr. Summerall's book, The discerning of spirits is a gift which enables one to appraise motives. But more than this, it gives the believer the power to see what others do not see. Howard Carter, who was uh, Dr. Sumrall's mentor, said, The discerning of spirits is a gift of the Holy Spirit by which the possessor is enabled to see into the spirit world. By this insight, he can... He can discern the similitude of God, the risen Christ, the Holy Spirit, the cherubim, the seraphim, the archangels, and the host of angels, or Satan and all of his legions. So it's a, it's really an amazing, amazing gifting, discerning of spirits. Um, so praise the Lord. Anyway, we're going to break up into groups now. So in your bulletin, there is a there are three points in there, and we're going to take a, like say the next twenty minutes or so. And give you a chance to talk together in groups of two or three or four. And uh, just chat about them. And then we'll come back and wrap this part up. And then we'll uh, receive our offerings and pray for people and minister as God wants to minister. 
So God bless you as you break up into groups.